This is Selma Schimmel for the group room at the 14th World Conference on Lung Cancer, WCLC, organized by the IASLC, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer. We are in Amsterdam. I'm now joined by Professor Dr. Keith Keir, who comes to us from Aberdeen University Medical School in Scotland, where you are Professor of Pathology. Thank you for being with us. Pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to finally be able to speak to someone about pathology because as we learn more and more about these genomic changes and these mutation drivers in the area of lung cancer, it's time to get the pathologist out of the lab, raise the profile and introduce the pathologist to the patient because you are becoming really one of the most important key players in the diagnosis and the identification of the genomic characteristics that will help design the appropriate treatment for the patient. I, I agree with you completely. I think that uh, the pathologist has always been regarded as something of a kind of backroom boy, perhaps providing a service but not really being involved terribly much in frontline care of patients. Of course, we always did have a role to play in, in the frontline care, but the uh, importance of pathology has really grown tremendously in the area of lung cancer recently and this is both in terms of what we've always done which is looked at the tumours and classified them in certain ways but the evolution of the importance of uh, molecular biology uh, in addition has really uh, put us uh, I suppose you could say in the spotlight and uh, this of course is good for patients it is good for the uh, better management of patients and of course it's good for pathology. A long time ago pathology was limited to the microscope. Mm -hmm. Today a microscopic or microscopic analysis of tissue and of cancer cells is hardly sufficient when we're capable of doing a molecular genotyping and screening of our tissue I would doubt that we're going to do away with the microscope, but I would think that there's this amazing collaboration between what you see under a microscope and what you're able to look at with molecular means. Absolutely. I think that the correlation between the, what we see down the microscope, the morphology, how the tumor looks, and the molecular picture that uh, we can gather from that particular tumor um, putting those things together, we stand to learn an enormous amount more about how these tumours develop, how they evolve, and of course how they can be treated and targeted. I agree also with you that I don't think uh, the microscope is going to disappear. Many of the molecular advocates have told me uh, often in the last few years that I'm going to be out of a job in a few years' time. I don't think so. I think that uh, morphology will always have a part to play. Apart from anything else, it is required to uh, select or to understand which parts of the sample that comes from the patient have to be tested. So, you know, we, we have to marry the two together and one does not replace the other. So what is the technical process when you get down to that genomic level? It's, it's much more complex than just looking under a microscope and making a slide. How is that analysis performed? You can actually perform the analysis in a number of different ways. Um, and the, the two major ways that you can perform the analysis is by looking for something in the tumor on the slide by targeting, using molecular techniques to target a particular feature or characteristic so that you can look down the microscope. But rather than just looking at the, the, the patterns and the morphology, you're, you're actually looking for signals that you've, you've um, created in that tumour which are driven by the molecular characteristics. The other way that you can measure things at a molecular level is by extracting the molecules from the tumour tissue. And those may be proteins, they may be nucleic acids including things like DNA. And then you have to analyse the DNA or the proteins in different ways depends which question you're asking. There are an enormous number of d different molecular aberrations that may be present in cancer cells. I believe there's around 
10 different mutations now, the common ones that, that we, we most relate to when it comes to lung cancer? At least, I guess. The, the, the 10 common mutations that are spoken of are um, particularly mentioned in relation to the commonest type of lung cancer, which is uh, what we call adenocarcinoma. There are, of course, other types of lung cancer, but adenocarcinomas are probably a, around the world, it varies, but about half of, of the lung cancers. And we now are learning that 10 mutations appear to be absolutely critical in about half of those adenocarcinomas. And when one of those critical mutations is present and driving the cancer, the others generally will not be there. So they're, they seem to be unique and individually key mutations for these tumours. And of course the important thing about these mutations is that if they are so important, so important in driving the cancer, they can be drugged, they can be targeted by a drug and switched off. So this is really the root of personalised medicine? Absolutely. That said, there seems to be a growing responsibility on the patient to be sure that once they've had tissue resected, that that tissue is properly examined by a pathologist that is able to look deeper beyond the morph morpho morphology mm -hmm. of the tumor, but the genomic characteristics. And I think that that is a message we need to drive home, that patients have to be sure that their tissue is being properly analyzed for these new mutations that we are aware of. I'm absolutely uh, sure that, that that is the case and it's an important consideration. The, the analysis of the, these cases is, is uh, very important. It has to be done in the proper way. The samples have to be prepared in an appropriate way. And we need to have, of course, enough material on which to do what is an increasingly long list of tests and we're in, a, we're in a curious environment in a way because other developments in medicine have really been geared towards uh, less and less intervention for the comfort and benefit of the patient. We talk about minimal intervention techniques and minimal intervention often, not always, but often means that the, the samples on which the pathologists have to work are getting smaller and smaller and yet the amount of information that we have to provide is getting more and more. So the role between the thoracic surgeon and the pathologist seems to be extremely intimate and important. Very important and this is one of the other uh, reasons why uh, the point you made in your very first question about the pathologist coming out of the laboratory and working in uh, what we call multidisciplinary teams with the oncologists, the physicians and the surgeons, everybody learning what everyone else does. It's been very interesting as we've become involved in these things how uh, little uh, some of our colleagues have understood about what pathologists actually do, but they're catching up. Well, this was a great primer. I hope that we will meet again and do something to help, as you call it, the laboratory to get the pathologist more visible, raise the profile, not just amongst your peers and colleagues, but directly to the patient to understand how pivotal the role is of their pathologist. Thank you, Dr. Professor Keith Keir, Professor of Pathology at Aberdeen University Medical School in Scotland. Thank you very much. Pleasure.